I've seen it. Okay, we're carrying on. Uh, Job, we're in, this, we're in the second cycle of speeches. You remember how the book breaks down? You've got the three cycle of speeches and some other things. In the second cycle of speeches, it began in chapter 15 with Eliphaz speaking. So remember, you get Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar. So the second cycle, Eliphaz speaks for the second time, beginning in chapter 15. And then Job speaks after him in chapter 16 and 17. And in chapter 16, verse 18, Job appeals for his cry for justice not to be silenced or exhausted. And then as I understand 16, 19 to 21, and there's obviously room for disagreement on how to understand this, but how I understand 16, 19 to 21, he says that the declaration of his innocence, that that stands as his witness in heaven, having been placed on record in the heavenly court. Now that's going to be important. The way I understand that is going to be important to how I understand chapter 19. So this is how I'm seeing this, that he's speaking of this, his testimony and his declaration of his innocence as something that is standing as his witness on file, so to speak, in the heavenly court. In 17, 3 through 4, he calls on God to vouch for his innocence because it was God who eliminated all his human supporters by punishing him so severely. God, in Job's mind, he punishes him, and because of that, everybody concludes that Job is this heinous sinner, and so he has no human supporters left. It's a way of complaining about what God has done to him. It's like saying God owes him for having mistreated him. He says God will not be exalted for having done that, because in Job's mind, God is wrong for having done that. So that's where we ended uh, last week. Now, in verse 5, this is one of these difficult uh, you know, texts to understand what's going on. The Hebrew of verse 5 literally reads, For a portion he tells friends, and the eyes of his children fail. Now, with David Kleins and a number of other people, I think it's best understood as a proverb along the lines of another proverb. I think it's best understood as a proverb along the lines of they are like a man's bidding his friends to a feast while his children are starving. See, that seems to be the sense of it. The point is that the friends who are condemning Job, they put up appearances of having plenty of wisdom, of having their cupboards full of wisdom, their overflow. That's their facade. That's, that's what they put up. But in reality, their cupboards are bare. The eyes of their children fail. Their children are starving. So though they pretend to be wise, they got nothing. Okay, that's what I think is the import of that. Verse 6 six and 7 of chapter 17, he bemoans the fact that in the eyes of the community, he's become a living illustration of the consequences of sin. One who's viewed with utter contempt. You can see here where he speaks about them spitting before him. You see, he says in 6, He's made me a byword of the peoples. I am one before whom men spit. That's like, that's really saying, you see, that you are, you're just worthless. You're just worthless, you see. So the, and then, then he speaks of the emotional torment caused by the community's disdain. That's just wearing him out. Now, for us, we are so individualistic that, you know, it may be hard for that to resonate with us, how the community's disdain would really wear on us. Our, our culture's attitude would be, so what? What do I care? You know, they can all take a flyer. But that's, that's not the, the world Job lives in. It's communal. And everybody in the community is looking at Job like he's dirt. And Job is a paragon of righteousness. That's part of what would kill you. I'm really a righteous guy. I'm, this is, I take this seriously. And everybody looks at him like he's complete dirt. So it's just emotionally wearing him out. He says in, in verses 8 and 9 of chapter 17 that the righteous man is appalled at, at the horror of Job's suffering And seeing it as an example of what sinfulness brings, the righteous man sees it, then he takes it as an example 
of what sinfulness brings, he's then roused by that to an even greater opposition to the ungodly because he assumes he's getting punished because he's sinning. So then he's aroused by that to a greater opposition of the ungodly. So his suffering, as it's misinterpreted through this lens of absolutist retribution theology, it confirms or it strengthens the righteous person's commitment to that understanding. They have a self-fulfilling perspective from which they will not be shaken. So I think that's what he's talking about there. Then he says in 1710, none of his three friends is a true wise man. And in verse 11, he expresses his hopelessness. And then in verse 12, he rebukes his friends for calling night day. You see, for claiming that, his, that, that the injustice done to him, that it's really justice. So he says, that's what you're doing. You're calling night day. And injustice is being done to me. I'm being punished when I don't deserve it. And you're saying, no, it is justice. You do deserve it. You see, and he also says, he tells them that for, ins for insisting that the light is at hand. If he will just repent. This is a constant refrain of theirs. If he will just repent, everything will be, be fine. In verses 13 to 16, he says despairingly that if he hopes for death, which he does, see, is the only way to be freed from his suffering. I mean, the guy is in torment. He says if he hopes for death, then any hope of vindication in this life, in this world, will die with him. Because when he's dead, he'll be cut off from the living. Those he wants to know the truth about his righteousness. All of these people who are living with him, who are now telling him, you're dirt, who are spitting before him, who are saying you're a, you're a pretender and a poser and you're getting what you deserve and we're happy about it because we hate people who pretend to be righteous when they're really serious sinners. He wants them to see. He wants them to see. To be vindicated that he says, if he dies, then in this world, for them, that won't happen. Then we get Bildad in chapter 18, verses 1 to 4. He asks how long Job will keep talking. And he advises Job to, to think more before he's speaking. And he rebukes Job for treating them as stupid. For treating them like they're cattle. So as I say, you have these wise men and they do this in their interaction with one another. He tells Job that all his railing will not change the reality of the situation. That's what this is about will not cause the world to be abandoned or the great rocks to be of these things that are impossible. All of your railing is not going to change the way things are, which for Bildad is that extreme suffering is a mark of sinfulness. You can talk all you want, complain all you want, but none of that is going to alter the fact that extreme suffering is the product of extreme sinfulness. So that's what Bildad is telling him. Then the remainder of chapter 18, in verses 5, I know that's an eye test, but in verses 5 to 21, it's this description of the kind of bad things that are in store for the wicked. He just lists things. You can see his, 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 strong, his strong steps are shortened. He's cast into the net. Terrors frighten him. His strength is famished. On and on and on. See, from this perspective they have, this is the kind of thing that is in store, the bad things that are in store for the wicked. They may flourish for a season. You see, there could be this temporary and brief flourishing, but their lives, according to Bildad, will take a dreadful turn. They'll take a dreadful turn, as had happened to Job. So he just looks at Job and says, yeah, yeah, you were going along great. You had all kinds of stuff, but here's how it works, Job. You were flourishing for a season, and then you got taken out. And so that's his perspective. That's what he thinks is going Okay, so this is his view, but the reality, see, this is not what Bildad is saying, but the reality of life, as is lamented by Kohelet in Ecclesiastes, a number of places, particularly in chapter 8, verse 10, the reality is that the wicked sometimes 
are healthy, wealthy, and happy throughout their lives. You just have to look around. Suffering for the wicked in this life is not a guaranteed or absolute outcome. Neither is avoidance of suffering by the righteous a guaranteed or absolute outcome. Other things can come into play. God is not some slot machine. He's not some, you know, mechanism that simply, he's a being. He's sovereign and other things can come into play. And so it's not this thing that's guaranteed and automatic. But Bill Dad and his friends, they, they don't seem to recognize that possibility as they jump from Job's suffering to the conclusion that he's sinful. That's all they need to see. I see this guy who's getting pounded and suffering like nobody I have ever seen. Well, therefore, I know for a fact that would not happen if he were not an extreme sinner. And so this is, what the, this is how they say it. Now, Job, Job responds or speaks next. And in chapter 19, verses 1 to 3, he complains about how they're emotionally tormenting him. How they're heaping shame on him by insisting that he really is evil and he's only getting his just desserts. I mean, can you imagine this? Everybody and his mother, you know. That you're a person of integrity, and yet everybody and his mother is just telling you, you know, you're really disgusting, you're horrible, you're evil, you're exposed now. You see the emotional tor torment. He says in verse 4 that even if he did something wrong, that's on him, as we would say. You see, even if he did something wrong, that's on him. In other words, his wrong and its consequences would not involve them, so they have no business piling on to add to his suffering. You know, it's like between, you know, between God and me. And so what are you doing? Coming in from the outside and just piling on as I'm suffering like this. He says in verses 5 to 7, that if they insist on coming at him, full bore, using his disgrace as proof of his sinfulness, then they need to know that God's already attacking him without mercy despite the justness of his cause. He's already getting killed. And in verses 8 to 12, he portrays God's assault on him. The kinds of things he's undergoing. And then in 19, 13 to 19, he speaks here of his total abandonment, his total abandonment by family, friends, guests, acquaintances, servants, and even young children. Everybody has turned against him. Everybody treats him like a dirtbag, like somebody that we, do, we don't, we don't even want to be around you. You're so disgusting, so evil. And I just, I, I just feel the emotion that Job has to be feeling here. He's wrongly despised by everyone as a hypocrite who's getting his comeuppance. You know, we as people love to see somebody who is a poser or who's a fraud who is getting caught. Right? I mean, that's what all the, you know, just pop on the internet or turn on, they're all, you know, it's an industry of trying to, you know, you can get, it's clickbait. You get people here by saying, listen, look at this guy. Oh, yeah, oh, we're exposing him for who? We caught him. See, he was over here saying that, yes, I'm all pro-life, pro-life, and yet he's urging his girlfriend to get an abortion. Okay, why is that interesting? Because there is this interest in somebody getting their just desserts. And this is how they view Job. He got his just desserts. And in 1920, Job speaks of his dire physical condition and how he's barely escaped death. This is where we get this idea by the skin of your teeth. 
That's where this comes. That's, that's a pretty narrow margin, right? Skin of your teeth. That's how he's escaped death. And then in verses 21 to 22, he begs for their pity as one who's been so ferociously targeted by God. He asks why they continue after him. Why they aren't satisfied with the suffering that God has already inflicted on him. You know, what do you guys want? I'm just reduced to nothing. I'm crushed. I'm scraping stuff off me. I'm in constant pain. Everybody hates me. You know, that's not enough for you? That's the point there. Then he says in verses 23 to 29. Now, these verses, they're notoriously difficult. They're notoriously difficult and there's much disagreement over the translation and the meaning of certain verses. So I, let, I alert you to that, okay? Controvert, they're hard to get at. But my understanding of the section has been shaped by what I take to be the insights of David Klein's and Samuel Ballantyne. Job says in 19, 23, and 24, he expresses his longings or his longing that his protestations of innocence and cry for justice that these things will be carved, inscribed in a stone, and then the letter inscriptions would be filled in with molten lead so that you would have like a stone that has carvings in which lead has been put there. And he's saying that he wants that as a permanent monument to his righteousness. That's what he would like to see. But he says in 25, but even without that, even if he doesn't get the stone monument with the lead in it that would stand as a permanent monument to his righteousness, he knows that his Redeemer lives, I think, in the sense he knows that his verbal proclamation of innocence that is now standing as his witness in heaven, that's back to 1619, remember I said that would be relevant to how I understood chapter 19, that, that verbal procl proclamation of innocence that's now standing in heaven, that ultimately, ultimately will be acknowledged as true and thus ultimately will be a source of his vindication or redemption from these slanderous judgments that have been made against him. Ultimately, whenever this happens, that that testimony that stands there will one day be acknowledged. That was the truth. And I think that's what he's talking about. Now, the problem, according to 1926a, the first part of 26, is that he believes this will happen only uh, after he's dead. Only after his skin has been destroyed. Whereas, according to 26b through 27b, he wants it to happen during this life. He wants it to happen during this life when he would see God with his own eyes. He wants to receive vindication before he's gone. He wants it here. I want to be vindicated to you. You who came up and spit before me, I want to be vindicated to you. You see, but he's convinced that's not going to happen. This is Job's perception. He's convinced that's not going to happen. But of course, what do we know? Job is wrong in that. Because it is going to happen. Because God is going to appear to Job in the storm. And Job is ultimately going to be vindicated. But Job doesn't feel that. That's what he wants. But he thinks he's, that's only going to happen when he dies. Now this word, Redeemer... The word is goel, and it's typ it typically refers to a kinsman redeemer, to the nearest male relative who comes to the aid of a distressed family member. But it sometimes is applied to God as one who comes to the aid of his people. Now, despite the fact that redeemer is in many English translations, it's capitalized, you see, which is signaling to you uh, something. But in many translations, it's capitalized. 
I think Job's cry for justice, I think that's what he means by his Redeemer from chapter 16, that he personifies. In other words, he, he treats it as though it's an entity or a being, a person. He personifies it and he casts that in the role. Let me read you what David Klein says. Klein says, why should Job hear call his deposition of character. You know, like in court cases, you take a deposition, somebody comes under oath, they give testimony, it gets filed. He says, why should Job here call his deposition of character, which is the content of his cry, why should he call that his goel, his redeemer? When in chapter 16, he had used more exclusively legal terms. The reason is plain from the context. This is the chapter in which he has most extensively elaborated his desertion by his relatives and acquaintances. Not one of them wants anything to do with him. So he has no Goel. He has no person who will go to bat, a champion, someone who will come and relieve his distress. So he says, wants anything to do, and he's bereft of any personal Goel who might defend his cause. God is his enemy, Job's perception. So he has no one to rely on except himself. He has to be his own Goel. Indeed, he objectifies his protestation of innocence into an entity that has something of an existence of its own and now dwells in the heavenly realm where there is a better chance of encounter with God. But that's no more than an image for the fact that Job himself has spoken, has challenged God to a lawsuit, and has presented his own affidavit of innocence. This remains a fact, whatever happens to Job himself, his words cannot be unspoken, and they indeed go on speaking for him as his kinsman champion. Now, whether you accept that or not, that makes sense to me. Okay, as I tell you, there's, there, this is tough sledding in here. I think that makes sense. Now, it is certainly true <clears throat> that Jesus is our Redeemer, okay? I mean, that's not, up, that's not up for discussion. Jesus is our Redeemer, and it's certainly true that we know that he lives. All right? But that doesn't depend on this text. We know that elsewhere, that Jesus is our Redeemer and that he lives. So with the vast majority of scholars, I don't think Job is referring to Jesus in verse 25. Now, you may disagree with that, but that's okay. But I don't think he's referring there. Indeed, the Redeemer of which Job speaks, it's something or someone that ultimately brings vindication from a God who, in Job's perspective, seems reluctant to give it. You see, Job, the Redeemer, is almost, in Job's view, set at some kind of odds with God. It is God who's crushing him. God who's doing these things. He needs something else to vindicate him. You see, that's his testimony up there. And if that's the right understanding of that, then that doesn't fit very comfortably with God's redemption through Christ. Although we sometimes look at it that way. We sometimes look at God as being this angry, judgmental, law God, the Father. And then here comes the nice Jesus and he rescues us from that. That's not biblical. That's not biblical. You see, the Father and Son are together in the redemption process, the redemption project, and the Spirit. God, the Trinity, is at work. It is not any of this pitting against one another. Okay, so I, I think here the way Job sees this, the way he character, that helps me to think this is the right track. Okay, but certainly uh, no certainty here. All right, 1927C, that last clause there, it avoids, it, Job voices the emotional exhaustion of his unmet longing for vindication for vindication and relief, this longing he's been after, wants it, wants it, relief, free me, free me, vindicate, vindicate me. And it's just exhausted him. We might say it's just completely burned him out or worn him down. In verses 28 and 29, he warns his friends that if they refuse to back off, if they refuse to, if they insist on slandering him, 
under their false belief that he is the cause of his suffering. That's this idea that the root of the matter is found in him. You see, if they keep slandering him under their false idea that he's the cause of his suffering, then they're doing wrong and they thereby are putting themselves in jeopardy of the punishment that they are convinced flows absolutely and mechanically to the sinner, you see? This is their idea. Sin, judgment, sin, punishment, punishment, punishment. So he says, you keep doing this and you are going to be the victim of that judgment that you are convinced flows absolutely and automatically. And in that case, you will know by experience that there is a judgment, that you may know the end there, there is a judgment. I think that's what Job is telling them. Now we get Zophar in chapter 20. So that's Job there. Then Zophar speaks in chapter 20. And he says in verses 1 to 3, he says that, that he's worked up by Job's words that insult him. So basically he's saying, I'm chapped. You see, the, the things that you're saying that insult me, and he feels compelled to respond. I got to say something about this. And he claims his response is not really his own, but it's some kind of spiritual authority. It's the inside of a spiritual authority that's given him some information or some insight. That seems to be what he's saying there in 1 to 3. And then in 20, verses 4 to 29... He asserts in different ways. He has a bunch of different ways, but he asserts that the wicked suffer and that any prosperity or good things that the wicked may enjoy, it's short-lived. That, the, that What happens is the wicked suffer. And if they have good things, it's just for a season, just for a brief moment. And then they're, they're taken out. Bildad made the same points in chapter 18. So he just has all these different ways. See, in verses 4, all the way through 29, he lists these different ways that the wicked suffer. And so that's in keeping, right? That this is how they see reality, that the wicked suffer. And again, as indicated in a number of Proverbs and Psalms, for example, in Proverbs 13, 11, Proverbs 21, 6, 11, 18, Psalm 73, the prosperity of the wicked often is temporary in this life. But it's a mistake to think that is an absolute rule. It often is temporary. But you can't think that, like I say, that God is some mechanism. God is a being. And God can be working other things as he's doing in this case. And you and I are privy to it. As the readers of the book. So that's the point, you see, that it can't be an absolute rule. There are many exceptions, cases in which the, the wicked have good things throughout their earthly lives. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 10 is just one indication where you have that person who's observing life and he says, look, I look around and I see, I see wicked people who are cruising fine, they're fat, they got stuff to eat. They're living in luxury and then they're dead. And he says, it looks just fine to me. Of course, even when the wicked enjoy good things throughout their earthly lives, that prosperity is still temporary when you measure it against their continuing life after death. Okay? So in that broader sense, you could say, well, yes, the rule is absolute, but Job and his friends don't think in those terms. They're not thinking in those terms. You see, as God in pre-patriarchal times, the setting of the book of Job, he had not yet revealed with any clarity the nature of the afterlife or the truth of the resurrection. So they're not talking that way. They're not saying, yes, the rule is absolute once you drop out and you consider the afterlife. That's not what they're talking about. They're talking about in the here and now. Okay, but it is true. In light of what we understand, it's absolute in that larger picture sense. But Job says in, in chapter 21, Job then comes and he, he responds to Zophar. In verses 1 to 3, he calls his friends to listen to what he's saying. You know, it's like he, he feels like I'm talking to a brick wall. 
I'm telling you, this is the truth of the matter, and it's just... Now, I'm sure none of us have ever had experiences like that. What you're talking to, it just doesn't matter what you say. But that's what Job is doing here. He calls him to listen to what he's saying. See, to let that be their act of, of comfort toward him. Let them hear him out. Then they can ridicule him. But at least hear me. That's what Job wants from them. And he says in verses 4 and 5, he indicates by a rhetorical question that his complaint is against God, not mere men. See, he, his complaint, he's got a beef with God because he's accusing God of injustice in allowing him to suffer this way. He says he has reason to be impatient, as will be obvious to anybody who simply looks at his horrible condition. Look at me, man. I look like a mushroom. Why do you think I'm not impatient? Have you ever seen somebody suffer like this? And yet I'm telling you, I do not deserve this. So yeah, I'm impatient. You got that right. 21.6, he trembles at the thought that there is no justice. That God does not punish the wicked and bless the righteous. You remember Job's in on this too, right? This is how Job sees the world. He sees that God punishes the wicked, blesses the righteous. But now his problem is he happens to know that he's righteous and yet getting slaughtered. So his conclusion is God's unjust. Their conclusion is, no, he's not. You're a sinner. So that's, that's the tension you see that they're facing here. Job then asserts in 7 to 17, very similar to Kohelet in Ecclesiastes particularly chapter 8, verse 10. Job asserts here, like Kohelet, and contrary to Zophar, that the wicked, those who are contemptuous of God, those who don't care a thing about God, that they thrive in this life. He says, that's a, they thrive. What are you telling me? You're telling me all of the stuff you list for me, all about the wicked get this, the wicked get that, that happens to them, that happens to them. He says, look, will you? There are plenty of examples of where the wicked are just doing fine. They're in the catbird seat. They got the big house. They got the big car. They're doing whatever they want to do. And they live to an old age and then they have a nice burial and everybody comes and says good things about them. You see, this is what Job is saying to them. You see, that, that the wicked... Those who are contemptuous of God, that they thrive in this life. And by Job's lights, God is not concerned with their conduct. He says, this is how it looks. He doesn't care. How could he care if he's letting this happen? And see, that's the flip side, I've told you. He lets the, right, the, the wicked prosper and be okay. So Job says, why do you think he's not going to punish the righteous? The flip side he's not doing it, so why do you think he's going to do this mechanically in this case? Then he says in 18 to 21, he says that the wicked should be just blown away. And he rejects the notion that God's failure to punish the wicked, that that can somehow be justified by the claim that he punishes the children of the wicked. Job says, that's not flying with me. The wrongdoer. That's the one who should be punished, and it means nothing to the wrongdoer to punish his offspring after he's dead. So don't, don't try to defend this here. When I tell you that I see this here, they say, yeah, 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 okay, okay. But, but he's going to punish their children. And he says, no, it's the wrongdoer who ought to get that. You see, so, so you can't get away from what I'm saying to you that way. And then the point of 22 to 26 is that, is that from Job's perspective, from his perspective, blessing and, blessing and bitterness in life, they're apportioned by God without rhyme or reason. That's how Job is looking at the world. Blessing and bitterness, that these things are apportioned by God, given out by God without rhyme or reason. One man has a life of abundance. Another person has a life of want. And then they both die. 
And Job says, look, from his view, there's no discernible rationale for the distinction. There's no discernible, we got this guy's living, you know, he's, he's fat and happy. This guy's barely living, struggling, suffering. And I look and I say, I don't see, there's no rationale. You see, there is no moral compass from Job's view and his commitment to this idea of retribution theology. Then he says in 21, in uh, 21, 27, we got there, yeah, in 21, 27, he says he knows his friends aren't interested in consoling him. That's not what they're about, but they're interested in hurting him. They don't care about helping him out. They care about hurting him. And then in 28 to 33, he tells them that the evidence for the wicked prospering, this is everywhere. Why are you acting like something I'm saying about the wicked prospering, that somehow this is a secret? You know, you got to have the special handshake to get in on this. He says that's not the case at all. They could ask any passerby on the road. It's like we'd say, just pick somebody out of the phone book. You could ask anybody, any passerby on the road. There are many cases of wicked people having good things throughout their lives, and they even have grand and respectful burials. That's what Job is saying. So don't tell me they just prosper for a while, and ultimately they get taken out in this life. They don't. There are a lot of cases where wicked people do just great in terms of health and material prosperity, and then that carries them all the way to their grave and they're celebrated in death. He says, this is, this is something you can just find out from anybody. Anybody with marginal awareness would be able to tell you that that is in fact the case. And then he says in 2134 that his friends are worthless comforters who are just pushing lies. That's, that's all they're doing. They're, they're, not, they're not interested in engaging. They're not interested in any of that. They've got an agenda and all they're doing, they won't listen to him and they're just pushing junk. And it's driving Job crazy. Now we get to the third cycle of speeches. Okay, we're getting close to the end, you see. Third cycle. But we're going to have the third cycle, then there'll be some, there'll be some more. Uh, you know, this is the third cycle. We'll have Elihu and, and God will appear. But in the third cycle... First bell, right? Okay. We have Eliphaz, all right? Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, right? Job after each. Third cycle, we're going to get Eliphaz, Job, Bildad, Job, no Zophar. All right, so here we have Eliphaz beginning the third cycle, and he says in verses 1 to 4 of 22, he asserts that, that human behavior, it doesn't contribute anything to God. It does not add to him or fill any kind of lack in God. If, for example, if Job was righteous as he claims, it would, this is according to Eliphaz, who knows nothing about chapters 1 and 2. You see, he says, so he says here that, that look, if Job was righteous, it would not be to God's benefit. And see, the, the rather obscure implication of that assertion is that human behavior gives nothing to God. The, the implication of that seems to be that no human can put God in his debt and thus no human can use God as his instrument for punishing a righteous man. He's going somewhere with this, but I admit that it's out there. It's obscure, but I think this is what he's saying is that look, no person can get over on God and put God in his debt. Therefore, God cannot be manipulated by anybody because God doesn't owe anybody. So no person could use God to punish a righteous person. In other words, it can't be, he can't simply be an instrument of some human being. He can't do that. God is above all human mani manipulation. And since that's the case, and since God is just, Job's suffering, his suffering is judgment for his sinfulness. 
Not his pie. In other words, we can be sure that what is being meted out to you is not God doing the bidding of some sinful human being because God is in no human being's debt. We can know that that's God's action against you. And since we know God is just, we can know that what you're getting is because you're a sinner. I think that's what he's, what he's getting after. He says in verses 5 to 9, he proceeds to accuse Job of all sorts of sin. Now this is chutzpah. Because this is all false. We know it's false. And yet he's willing to charge Job with these kinds of things. He, he accuses Job of all sorts of sins in an attempt to justify Job's suffering from within his theological framework. So he accuses Job. He claims Job mistreated the poor, the powerless, the widows and the orphans, all of which, as I say, is nonsense. He didn't do that, right? He says expressly then in chapter 22, verses 10 and 11, that that is why Job is suffering. That's their idea, right? He says, come on, Job, you have mistreated the poor, the widows, the sufferers, taken advantage of them, abused them. So that's why you're being punished the way you are. That's why you see what it leads them to do. It leads them to lie for God. Because this is false. But they think they're doing God's bidding. That is why God will come back and say to them, All right, Job, I understand you. You spoke about me what was right. Not in everything, obviously. But these guys. Mm -mm. Okay? This is the kind of thing that they wind up doing. Now, in 22, 12 to 14, I know the bell's going to ring. Eliphaz says, he says that Job claims that God is ignorant of what goes on in the world. The implication being that, that Job's punishment, that it's a misjudgment that's born of ignorance. He says, well, that's what you, that, that seems to be what you're saying, Job, is that God is ignorant and so your punishment isn't really justice, it's some kind of misjudgment of God's that's born from ignorance. Whereas Job, Job does wonder. He does wonder whether God knows his situation, but he apparently, as Longman says, he suspects that God does indeed know what's going on, but doesn't care. That's how Job looks at it. He said, no, I think he knows, but he doesn't care. God is unjust. Judging the innocent and the wicked the same. Second bell, that's right. Yeah, let me know that. Thanks for coming. Who knows, I'll keep talking. Right, this 